I'm Jason Rankin, and welcome to the Grasscheck Podcast, brought to you by AgriSearch and AFBI. We are bringing you the latest information, insights, and opinion to improve grazing management on your farm. This week, we are joined by Kat Houston from AFBI to discuss the latest information from the Grasscheck Plots and Farms, Connell Keown from Caffrey, and Ryan Carr, a Grasscheck dairy farmer who farms near Downpatrick. Grass growth has been a bit of a roller coaster during 2020. What is current grass growth like compared to the seasonal norm? So the growth on the plots has been sort of bang on the seasonal norm for sort of this week and last week. We're seeing slightly higher growth rates on the grass check farms than on the plots. So plots are sitting at 9.2 kilograms dry matter per hectare per day. Farms are coming in around 18 to 20. But we have seen both plots and farms with a significant drop in grass growth over the past couple of weeks. That being said, we've still got quite good soil temperatures and some farms are still making good use of grazing at the moment where the sort of ground is holding up for them. What growth are you forecasting for the coming two weeks? So the forecast is sitting around six kilograms dry matter per hectare per day as the growth rate sort of over the next two weeks staying pretty steady around that. The weather forecast is looking a little bit cooler and a little bit wetter. But I think it's important to bear in mind that those forecasts are for the plot growth rates. And at this time of year, we do tend to see lower growth rates on the plots than on the farms, just because we're not adding any fertiliser of any kind after mid-September on the plots. They don't get the benefit of the autumn sort of slurry applications that most of the farms will have had. And that's sort of where the difference in the growth rates tends to come in just at this point in the year. What has grass quality been doing in recent weeks? So grass, sort of the ME value has been between 11 and 11.6 over the last three or four weeks. It's still a very decent nutritional value in that autumn grazing if you're able to get out and make use of it. The dry matter has been much more variable and it's just very much dependent on the weather that farms have been seeing. So just the values that were in the farm results this week were dry matters as low as 13% or as high as 20%, just depending on who'd had recent rain before sampling. In total, how much grass was produced in the plots and the farms during 2020 compared to the seasonal average? And did the second half of the year make up for the dry spring? So we're looking at yields on the plots being 1.4 tonne down on the long-term growth curve average this year. That loss, as you say, it was mostly over the springtime with the dry conditions and the soil moisture deficit that we saw that was holding BRAC growth, particularly in May, but also the end of April and start of June as well. So we've had growth over the autumn time being much more typical, a little bit above average, but not enough to really make up any of that deficit that we've seen. For the grass check farms, it's really dependent on location when you look at total production over 2020. So plot yields were coming in at a total production of 11.1 tonne, and we've seen 11.1 to 11.2 tonne on farms in Derry and Antrim and Down as well this year. Tyrone and Fermanagh seem to have had a much better season. They were probably enjoying being slightly drier than normal for them in the spring, but they didn't suffer so much from the soil moisture deficit. So they're seeing average yields of 12.2 and 12.3 tonne this year. Ryan, 2020 has been a year of weather extremes. How has the 2020 grazing season gone for you? Started off really well. We had plenty of grass in the spring to get the cows out early and got it mostly utilised quite well. It was difficult weather with the rain in February, but it wasn't really the amount of rain we had. It was just how wet it made, if that made any sense. So we backfenced a lot of fields and moved on them quickly. So once we got over that there, it was quite good. And then we hit the dry period and that really came again at a real bad time whenever growth should have been ramping up and we became short of grass. Now, it didn't mean that we had to buffer feed, but it meant that we could get no great amount of grass built up so they didn't make first cuts were lighter, way lighter than normal, maybe about 40% back. So I reckon in my figures, I lost about two tonne of dry matter there in that period. And it hasn't compensated since. Growth was good enough 
during the summer and then in September it wasn't anything special. Whenever we should have built cover again to build our high average farm cover, we just couldn't get up there to 2,400, 2,500. So that has left us a wee bit short coming into our last rotation here in, at the end of the year. Having experienced a severe drought in 2018, what lessons did you learn from that experience which helped you mitigate the impacts of the dry spring this year? The first lesson we learned even during the drought in 2018 was we have to have an emergency supply of silage there to go through a drought again because the length of it was so severe that you just can't afford not to have that there. So you can't just spend 2019 with a real good grass growing year here building up that surplus. So now you can farm with the, the shackles off. You can push it there. Think, even if it doesn't rain, you can say, I'm still going to give them the grass. I'm still going to give them a bit of meal. Because you know if the worst comes to the worst, you've got a pit of silage, a good high quality silage sitting there to feed them. And in 2018, we didn't have that because it might have probably the worst spring and of April time and then into a drought. So that has to be there on a dry farm. You just have to have that emergency supply. So as a lot of farmers would say, it's money in the bank. So this year, we had more confidence to just keep on grazing. And, well, if the worst came to the worst, we've got sides there to feed them. Connell, you work with a lot of dairy farmers in County Down. What are the key differences between those farmers that managed to cope with and adapt to the extremes in the weather that 2020 has brought and those farmers that have struggled? Yeah, there seems to be a real challenge in dealing with that extreme weather conditions. And that's that's the real problem is how do you how do you build in as as Ryan mentioned there, how do you deal how do you build in flexibility to be able to deal with that shortfall in grass supply? And that's that's the real problem. And it's about being flexible, I suppose. And those that have been flexible, I think, have dealt and coped better with the variations in weather. Whether that be a spring calving farm or, or an autumn calving farm or whatever, the ability to be flexible and to move to supplementation much quicker and having that, as Ryan mentioned, their stock of sort of fallback silage sitting is absolutely critical. It's funny now that I, I what I have seen on farm is a, a massive makeup, you know, a, a, an increase in grass growth this year. And I, I, I'm surprised Kate's saying that, that it maybe hasn't made up the shortfall. But in my opinion, I've never seen as much grass being grown in, in late season. You know, I've never seen as many paddocks being taken out, many bales made off a grazing platform. And, you know, even other guys, you know, in, in, in silage systems, they've moved to four or five cuts of silage. And to me, they have coped really, really well. So they've maintained the quality of that silage. They've maintained the quality of their grazing platform. And I think those measures that they've taken, you know, that moving in, getting the grass cut off earlier, ensuring the good quality stuff's taken is the mechanism to cope with those extreme weather. So be ready to deal with it whenever it does come and have the, the, the surplus there to deal with it whenever it's not there. If we look at the other side of that coin, Jason, and say, look, you know, what are the indicators that someone hasn't coped very well with the extremes in weather? I see a lot of people that have made very, very bulky silage very, very low protein levels, low energy levels. And it, it's funny, as Ryan said earlier on there, the, the dry spell kicked in in May. You know, that's our real grazing season. You know, the grass is at its optimum. You know, so the growth was delayed effectively later in the season. So we're into sort of a time of year whenever the grass plant itself wants to go into sort of more like a reproductive sort of mechanism in it. You know, so I think that's what's give us the very low energy level, especially those farms that let it grow on. You know, grass growing at 110 kilos a day, you know, over a couple of days, it'll move very quickly into, into a seed head situation for for silage or whatever, but more so even for grazing. So those farms that dealt with it well, got in early, got their their paddocks cut out, got their silage cut, and as I say, moved to a more four or five cut silage system. They have, they have cooked well. The others now, I suppose, look, Jason, the reality is the full price of that well, has yet to be paid through the winter months with lower quality silage, especially in, in, in the east down area. So a lot of silage analysis coming back suggesting very, very low protein and not to as big an extent, but low energy, low energy silage. Powell says there flexibility. And I think that's for any dairy farmer utilizing grass, that's very important. Farmers give out about calendar farming, but so many farmers farm by the calendar. They put the cows out on the 10th of April or the 10th of March 
just because that's what they've always done, or they house them on the 15th of September or the 1st of October. The way the weather's been in the last number of years, we don't know whether February's going to be a wet month or a dry month, or May's going to be a really warm month, or lots of rain, or August it's been raining. So farmers have to look at what's happening currently out there, walk their farm, see what conditions are like, and then react to that because they can grab two weeks of grazing in any month of the year, basically, if they have grass out there, which is quality feed. Whereas if they just say, oh, it's a certain date and we're not putting them out to grass, I think that's where Connell says their grass next thing gets away ahead of them and then it's not a high quality feed. So utilising and being flexible on the time of year and getting some sort of stock out onto that grass is going to be good for their economics and it's also been going to be good for their milk yield. Ryan, what is the grazing situation on your farm currently? Yeah, currently we're in our last rotation. On a normal year, we've closed up fairly late here, around the 15th of October. It's usually whenever the first field closed this year, just growth hasn't been as good. So we've took a date from the 8th of October, which is a week earlier, and anything grazed from that on will be closed, not grazed again. We have 60% to graze between the 8th of October and the 1st of November. And that 60% is crucial because this is going to give us our grass wedge to get our cows out in February. So that grass in October, them fields in October, grow the grass that's available for the cows in February. So each week we're measuring with AgriNet and we've made an autumn rotation planner and we've got a set target to graze each day. Currently there with a week left to go, we're around 48% and we should look to hit our 60%. Now, if we think we're going to be not hit that there, we'll move into lower cover fields and get them taken off in order to hit that 60%. Pre-grazing yields are lower this year. The reflection of that there has meant our cows will be milking better, just a higher quality feed than into them. But obviously, we're going through it faster, and that's why we've brought our, our closing date back a week. Are there any other key steps you'll be taking over the next couple of weeks as the grazing season comes to a close? You, you actually almost answered that question with the last question, so you really actually covered it fairly well, Ryan. Okay, Connell, what are the key steps farmers need to take to set up the grazing platform for the spring? A few few key steps, Jason, really, to get it right. And look, Ryan has touched on them all there and, and is very right on the money there. But the key message, I think, needs to be got out there that Decisions made right now and this month, especially this month, will have a serious impact on what you have got for spring grazing. Any God's amount of research out there, Jason, shown that spring grass, powerful feed, perfect for, for cows, perfect for profit, perfect for every, everything's perfect about it. So that let's utilize it. So we've got to be able to get the grazing block in line to be able to capitalize on it. So if we want to keep grass in the cows, as long as possible in the cow's diet, we've got to get realistic about closing up our grazing block in during the autumn. And it's simple things, Jason, like creating an autumn plan, as Ryan mentioned there, splitting your grazing block into sort of weekly chunks and taking it chunk by chunk until you reach your target of in and around that 60 to 70 odd percent of the farm closed up by the 1st of November. You know, and that does vary, it varies greatly from Tyrone to County Down, but generally speaking, put a plan in place for your own specific farm and target getting good quality grass grazed off. And and I suppose, look, the whole idea is to, you know, to hit good residual heights so that we're sitting, Jason, with lowish covers, you know, allowing the light into the base of the plant is, is the whole secret here. And, you know, what I see on farm is that some farms, they, they start off closing, but then the grass recovers quite quickly and they go back over it again and I think that's that's a no-no so don't go back over it once you start closing so if a farm starts closing on the very first day of October you know look that's it closed I suppose look in terms of average farm covers or, or what are what are we looking for and in terms of a target my my rule of thumb would be sort of like mid-November as a, as a closing date in County Down and I would sort of I would be talking about in the early 2000s in terms of average farm cover you know for closing effectively that's going to grow away all through the winter time and you're, you're going to have an opening cover there of something fairly decent every March. but i suppose look it's, it's setting up it's doing those basic things jason and having a bit of a plan in place to allow your grazing block to set up. Look, it's at the end of the day, it's money in the bank. It should be treated as an asset, and it's about getting it set up correctly so that it, that it's in place for 
the spring herd. You know, a lot of people I find, Jason, are they're grazing through the winter, through the autumn, but they're not really planning ahead. So, you know, by setting up this grazing block, you're planning ahead for your herd to come the springtime. Now, that herd could be a herd of spring calving cows, or it could be a herd of, of autumn calved cows sort of in early to mid lactation. You know, and it will differ slightly, you know, in terms of your, your farm cover, what you want there, depending on, the, on your herd type. I would say they're the basics, Jason, there that Ryan and myself have covered. Ryan, given the continuing price volatility and uncertainty, many farmers will be looking to get more out of grass. What practical recommendations would you give to farmers to help them get the most from grass? The first and most important is grass quality. Many farmers are afraid of running out of grass, especially if they're highly stocked. But this is self-defeating because they go into higher covers, high pre-grazing yields, and then the, their cow performance drops, other things are affected. So this is where pre-grazing yield is so important. The more milkier the cow, the lower that pre-grazing yield should be, definitely under 3,000. That has to be non-negotiable, especially if you're feeding a high-yielding dairy cow. Other things are important is infrastructure to actually get to the grass. There's no point having this grass if you, you can't get to it, so laneways and water are extremely important to actually utilise the grass. And then following on from that there is the residual you leave behind. If you don't eat that grass down, you're going to have a poor quality feed coming back next time and it's going to hit milk production and protein in again. If you can go into that lower pre-grazing yield, you can hit that residual so much easier for the cow. That would be definitely the, the best practice. Colin, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I think it, Ryan's covered everything there. And, you know, I think there is a growing interest in trying to get more from grass not only from an environmental perspective, but also, look, it's a financial thing. It's our cheapest feed. Let's 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 capitalise on it. Soil fertility, I see, is, is, is a real issue, you know, um, out on farm and getting, you know, if we're going to grow more grass, we need to be getting real about soil fertility and feed the stuff. More more days at grass is another is another key one Ryan touched on in terms of grazing infrastructure and grazing management, getting that pre and post grazing targets met. There's another area in there that I encounter quite a lot and it's herd fertility and, and calving profiles in terms of capitalizing on grass. A lot of the higher output farms now, in terms of higher production per cow, struggle to utilize grass. And it's simply a result of calving profile and not having the cow at the correct stage of lactation for, to be able to allow that cow to capitalize on, on grazed grass. A very high production cow, calving in the springtime being, being moved out onto grass doesn't really work that well. Whereas if that same cow calved earlier in the season, it calved even in the autumn time and she was over peak lactation, that cow can really capitalise on grass through the, through the spring and summer months. And I think that is an area that we really need to focus on on a lot of farms in Northern Ireland is getting that calving profile right and having the herd calving at the correct time to allow the herd to capitalise on grazed grass. But other than that, Jason, and having a really good plan in place, you know, in terms of an autumn and spring grazing plan, I think there are key components for trying to get more out of grass. Well, Colin there is saying there, rightly, that grass is our cheapest feed. But I think it's probably one of our most neglected feeds because it's just out there, put some fertilizer on, it grows. And it's nearly seen as we're not sitting down at a computer or we're a nutritionist or working out ME and all. But all that there is in there in the field and it's all working away on its own. So it gives us a benefit being the cheapest feed, but it can also give extra money for all the dairy farmers out there in our increasing our protein and our solids there. If you can hit them there pre-grazing yields, that will be shown no matter what type of cow you have in the tank. And if you can get up, depending on what type of cow you have, up above the bases of protein and fat, or move on and increase your bonus for every 0.1 that you go up, that's extra money in the farmer's pockets by utilising the grass out there. But again, it's what you put into the cow is what you get out in the tank and what you get paid for. So that there can be a big income stream over the whole year if you can increase that across your whole herd. That's it for this episode of the Grass Check podcast. And my thanks to Kat Hewson from AFBE, Colin Keown from Caffrey and Ryan Carr for joining us. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. For more information, you can go to the Grass Check website, www.agresearch.org slash grasscheck, and the Grass Check social media channels. 
This is the final Grass Check podcast for 2020. I'm Jason Rankin, and join us in the spring for the next Grass Check podcast. Until then, stay safe. <laughs>